geocentrism and interplanetary logistics in any public discussion on the subject of space and in many of the more obscure professional discussions on the subject, geocentrism raises its ugly head. There are many who will argue vehemently against human occupation of space. They will reject anything regarding expansive use of space. Some will claim that we must go to heroic efforts over decades or centuries to terraform Mars or one of the moons of Jupiter. Others eagerly search for life on other planets in order to argue that we should not disrupt the pattern of those life forms for which there is no proof, even at the cost of the existence of humanity. And the other forms of life on Earth, still others will argue that we must find Earth-like planets around other stars and develop as yet unproven propulsion systems in order to go to those stars only to find out that perhaps those planets are of no use to us. When the subject of the value of use of local space comes up, they will argue that the only use for local space is what can be brought back to Earth from that environment and what its value might be versus the expense of bringing it back from space. The most honest of doubters and obstructors will very quietly whisper their fear. The best and brightest of humanity will leave Earth and leave them behind. This may be at the heart of much of the resistance to humanity entering space in large numbers. When the way was opened for people to travel from Western Europe, the Near East, and Asia to the North and South American continents, the best and brightest did, in fact, go. This was not, however, a detriment to those who stayed behind in Europe, Africa, and Asia. In fact, many benefits to humanity as a whole have resulted. It should not be forgotten that many mistakes were made and much harm was done to some. As we move into space, and we will, we should keep these lessons in mind. As it says in the Constitution of the United States of America, all men are created equal. Ultimately, a structure of representative government and law is necessary for the success of humanity in space flight in the future. In all of the greater adventures of mankind, there have been doubters, naysayers, and obstructors. The names of all these are forgotten. The ones we remember are those who rejected that and found a way past them to pave the way for a better future for us all. Those devils are worth nothing except that they teach us how to strengthen our argument for success. There is another metric by which we may look at the value of space. Every person born brings a quanta of potential contribution to the success of humanity and indeed of the life of Earth, yet the Earth itself is a finite environment. This begs the question of what do we do when humanity reaches a population level that outstretches the ability to support the level of population on the Earth alone. Not only is the Earth finite in real estate, it is also finite in duration. Unlike many, I do not propose the artificial constriction of the growth of humanity. I find this far too pessimistic to consider it an option. With these three factors in mind, our solar system becomes a welcome and timely advantage to all life on Earth. From the perspective of the businessman, one trillion customers is better than eight billion. From the perspective of the explorer, Earth has been thoroughly examined and visited by humanity with few options left for the explorer to discover truly unique environments. From the perspective of the environmentalist, fighting the growth of human population without leaving the Earth is a losing battle and destructive to the beautiful Earth that we have while we have it. Vast numbers of humans emigrating into space reduces the population of Earth by voluntary action without sacrificing the benefits of each person has on the success of humanity. To the perspective of the biologist, the expansion into sp space provides a perfect comparison between the effects of living on Earth and the effects of living in various environments in the solar arena. It turns out that the different forms of life on Earth, plants and animals, insects and fungi, all have different relationship with gravity. In order to map this out, the alternative environment of microgravity and low gravity environments is a boon to botany and biology. We know that lettuce will grow in microgravity because we've done that on the ISS, the International Space Station. This makes for an embarrassingly small sample and does not include the few other biologic forms that have been taken to the International Space Station. But that doesn't change the fact that an embarrassingly small amount of biological 
botanical, and fungal research has been done on the microgravity environment of space. With an aggressive expansion of the human occupation of space, opportunities will arise to bring more and more forms of life from Earth into the space environment, preserving them well beyond the demise of Earth, regardless of what humans do to Earth or don't do to Earth. We have already seen the advantage to our state of knowledge in the medical arts of people who have spent large time spans in microgravity under the intense scrutiny of doctors back on Earth. In the perspective of the astronomer, a vast increase in the extremely large telescopes of a wide variety of types for within the space environment dramatically increases humanity's vision into the cosmos. From the perspective of the Earth defense professional and industrial infrastructure spread throughout the solar system means a vast increase in our options for redirecting asteroids that Earth should never have to worry about again. Any average construction worker is more than tough enough to survive three minutes of high G with a week of training in a centrifuge. There are billions of people who are capable of being sent to space. If you can get through a top-rated roller coaster ride, you can handle a SpaceX ride to orbit. Shielding is certainly a well-understood problem, and if you assume that all materials must be shipped from Earth, all components, all parts, everything, then of course the problem becomes intractable. But it's really not a problem once you apply logistical analysis and application. How do we produce products on Earth when we don't have those products to begin with? We find a portion of the Earth that within the soil has the material we need. We extract that material, and through many different processes and equipment, we produce stock materials, and from those stock materials, we produce finished products. That requires a supply chain and a labor chain. The supply... If we export infrastructure first to the moon in a small scale, we can build all of the stock materials and other equipment we need from there. That changes everything about the scale in which we can imagine building. Up to this point, none of the designs take realistic account of an extant infrastructure on the moon. I have and have been working on this for some time. Thank you for your time. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share. Darren Marchant, American Nomad News. So rain's not so bad. No. No, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm hiking through to Austin. You have a good day. We're never safe. Thank you.